Part 1. You will hear a woman asking for information about party venues. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, good morning. My name is Alan. What can I do for you? Hi, my name's Rachel Wilson. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties. Yes, we do. We have various sized accommodation. It depends on what you're looking for, really. We're looking to hold a party, a children's birthday party, and we need a room that holds about 90 people with space for a small disco area, games, dancing and food. Well, we have a large room, and it would certainly hold at least 100 people comfortably. It is used a lot for parties, things like that. That sounds as if it might be suitable. I've tried various venues and they're either booked up or they don't hold enough people. Can you tell me when you were thinking of holding the party? I know it's short notice, but we wanted to hold it Saturday week. That's September the 21st. Let's have a look. Mm. Yes, you're in luck. The Mandela Suite is free then. I'll just write that down. M-A-N-D-E-L-A -E And the time? When were you thinking of holding it? In the afternoon, from 3.30pm to 9 o'clock p.m. Yes, OK. There's no smoking on the premises, and we are only licensed to have soft drinks. That's OK. I think I'm happy to go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you'll have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Can you just give your postcode? It's PA57GJ. Fine. And the flat and street number? It's flat number 40 and the street number is 38 Beaches Street. OK, so that's flat 40, 38 Beaches Street. Yes, that's right. And a contact number? My landline is 22. 3279 with the code, but I'll give you my mobile number which is 078-9729-3381. OK. Can you tell me how much it will cost? It's quite reasonable, actually. It's £115 for the hire of the room, with tables and armchairs. But if you want to hire disco equipment, We've got a basic system with speakers and other equipment for £25. But there is no technician around in case anything goes wrong. And, of course, it's optional. That would save us carting something from home. But maybe we should have a spare sound system just in case. We have never had any problem with the system. But you might not want to take any chances. What about catering? Well, we had thought of getting everyone to bring something. We have someone who can do catering for £9 a head, including the cake, if required. That's handy, but it's a lot as we have a fairly tight budget. So, you want to go ahead with the booking? Yes, certainly. OK. I need to take a deposit of £30.50, which is refundable. The balance needs to be paid two days before the event at the latest. Fine. You can cancel up to two days before, but after that you lose the deposit. We don't intend to cancel, but is there any insurance we can take out? Yes. There is a form here somewhere. How much? It's 
Let me see. It's only nine pounds for the twenty-four hour period, and that covers you for cancellation, damage, and injury. Well, at least we'd better have a look at it. How would you like to pay the deposit? Cash. I'll give you a receipt. There you are. Ten, twenty, and thirty. Thirty pounds, Rachel Wilson. Thank you very much. I'm really glad I found somewhere. We have been trying to book a place for the past two weeks. So thank you again, and bye for now. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear an introduction to a camping trip. First, you'll have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen to the talk and answer questions eleven to fourteen. So, as you see, it's going to be quite an action-packed weekend. Well, that's all from me. So I'd now like to hand you over to Mary, who is going to tell you about the camping trip we've arranged for the coming week. Mary, it's over to you. Thanks, Pete. Well, as Pete just mentioned, the camping trip has been organised for the coming week, which means that it will probably be quite chilly, especially at night. So I guess clothing would be a good place for me to start. Now, as I said, be prepared for some chilly starts. A good woolen sweater is an absolute must. Thermal underwear would also be a good investment, although I'm not suggesting you dash out and buy some. But if you do happen to have some knocking around, I'd certainly recommend taking them. You may also consider taking walking boots. They really do help to protect your feet from the undergrowth and offer good support for your ankles. In fact, sprained ankles are one of the most common injuries on trips such as this one. But if you don't have any, don't worry too much. A good strong pair of shoes will do just as well. After all, we're not going rambling or potholing. But what I strongly suggest is that you buy some lightweight waterproof clothes. You know the sort of thing; they fold up very small and easily fit into your pocket. But do make sure they are both windproof and waterproof. This is very important because it can get very windy on the moors this time of year, and the chill factor can actually be very dangerous. People have even died from exposure simply because they weren't protected from the wind. So make sure you have those waterproofs with you. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you'll have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Now for equipment, a torch would be handy, especially if you need to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. A small pocket-sized torch is ideal. You don't need anything that's too big. A pocket knife is always handy too, especially a multi-purpose knife. 
a Swiss army knife is ideal. Now, this may sound strange, but take some plastic bags along too. They're ideal for putting over your shoes if the ground is wet, and they really do keep your feet warm and dry. That's about it for equipment. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, all the camping equipment will be provided, so you don't need to bring your own. In fact, the tents will be erected by the time we get there, so you won't have much work to do, which I'm sure will come as a welcome relief. We'll be camping on the edge of the forest, so with some luck, we should see some wildlife. Deer, buck, badgers and hedgehogs are very active this time of year, so it's certainly worth taking your camera along. But I must insist that the animals' needs come first. Always remember that we'll be camping in their home, so we must respect both their privacy and their territory. So it's very important that A. You never, and I repeat, never leave discarded rubbish lying around. And B. That you keep the noise level to a minimum at all times, especially at night. I know that some of you are concerned about insects. After all, camping does seem to have an image of creepy crawlies. But let me reassure you now that insects are never disturbing. In fact, and this may come as a bit of a surprise, they are generally very shy creatures and prefer to keep well out of people's way. Anyway, we're running short of time so I'll wrap up now, but what I'd like to say before we go and have lunch is that one of the greatest rewards of camping is to simply appreciate nature, to get away from the overcrowded cities and just enjoy the natural sights, sounds and smells of the countryside. OK, so we can go for lunch now, but if there are any questions you'd like to ask, I'll be available all day. Just come along to my office. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 First, you'll have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, my name is Rosanna McLaren. Um, I'm a bit early, but I have an appointment to see the assistant registrar, Andy Matthews, at 10am. Hi, I'm Andy Matthews. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My tutor advised me to come to see you about changing my course. Yes, I've had an email from your tutor, David Vine. Let me just call it up. Here we are. It says Tutee Rosanna McLaren is on the Wednesday part-time course and wants to change to the distance learning program. Have you any problems with the course itself? Oh no, I love it. I think the course is really worthwhile. The theoretical sessions once a week on Wednesday from 10am to 3pm are really good. You have two hour sessions then? Yes, that's it. And I have to say, I think the practical session from 4 through to 9 in the fashion workshops are also good fun. But I am finding it all very tiring, and it makes me too exhausted for my work on Thursdays and Fridays. You work the other four days of the week? Yes, and some Saturdays. I see. So, what do you want to do? I'd like to change to the programme with the distance learning component instead of the Wednesday sessions. Yes, that is a possibility. I see from your tutor, Dr. Vine, that he has no problem with this, but you realise it's possible you'll have a different tutor. Yes, I'm aware of that. It's a shame because he's a very good tutor. What do I need to do now? First, we just need to fill in this transfer form and the claim form for the reduction in fees. Oh? 
I didn't realize it was cheaper. Oh yes, it's a thousand pounds less a year. It gets even better. Can I start the distance learning program from now? I don't see why not. I just need to get a signature from your tutor, which should take only a short time. I'll email it to him now, and then he can sign it and put it in the internal mail. Okay. But I also need to go through with you what is involved in the distance learning program to make sure you are clear about everything. Well, I understand I attend the weekend course once a month, and that I can book a bench in the fashion workshop at any other time. You have a computer at home for the distance learning. Oh yes, I have the necessary equipment for making video calls over the internet already. It's the flexibility of the distance learning over the internet that is very useful. What makes it even more interesting is that I don't have to spend a lot of time travelling to and from the university on the Wednesday. I can adapt it to my own routine, as I will be able to do the theory over the internet from home when I want. The same is true of booking a tutorial online using Skype. Yes, it is amazing, isn't it? It's in its infancy, but it's been up and running for a year now, and it's going rather well. Could I just ask if it's possible to have a face-to-face -face tutorial at any time as well? There is no reason why you shouldn't be able to. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. What about the assessment for the distance learning? I take it that it's the same as for the other program. Let me see. Each month, you are expected to keep a written course diary and to present a seminar paper. And at the very end of the course, there will be a written exam which will account for thirty percent of the total marks. What about the coursework? How much does it account for? The design portfolio, which you need to present at the end, accounts for fifty percent. I would point out just one thing, and that is that on the distance learning program, some tutors like to see the design portfolio twice each term to make sure you are on the right track. But of course, you can take it in at any time to show your tutor. And as part of the assessment for the portfolio, you have to present at least one fashion item at a fashion show. At the end of the course. Is there anything else? No, that's it. Thank you for all your help. No problem. Hope it all works out well for you now. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a lecture on the subject of population growth and decline around the world. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now you may be wondering why I've entitled this lecture "Decline of the White Man." Well, my lecture today is concerned with the population growth and decline around the world, as well as migratory movements of people. 
But first of all, it's important for us to cast our minds back several hundred years to the time of the great explorers and the founding of America. When Columbus discovered America in the 15th century, it sparked off the imagination of many people. Europe at the time had reached a level of technology and social stability that allowed them to explore the world, and in doing so they realized that the world was much bigger than they'd previously imagined, with vast areas of largely uninhabited land, such as the newly discovered America. Moreover, overcrowding in European countries, together with a desire for economic expansion, led many people to look to the newly discovered lands. However, not only was America sparsely inhabited, it was rich in natural resources, such as iron ore, coal, and tin. In other words, it meant that the people of Europe could increase their already significant wealth, and in doing so, increase their domination over the world. So it was that many thousands of people migrated to the new land. Over time, of course, America rose to become an economically very powerful nation, a superpower in fact, and as a superpower, they now dominate world trade. But let us come back to modern-day Europe for a moment. What we see happening today is a rise in the number of educated people who are keen on developing well-paid careers, and whilst this in itself is not a problem, young people are marrying much later in life and having fewer, if any, children. This is leading to a decline in birth rates. So what many Western countries, not just Europe, are suffering from is an aging population. By an aging population, I mean that there are too many old people who don't work and therefore don't contribute to the economy. In contrast, there are far too few young people to work and create wealth for the country. Now, over the past several months, I've been involved in some research with a number of colleagues of mine from different universities around the world. As part of our research, we've been involved in conducting a demographic survey when we attempted to track and catalogue the movement of the world's population. Now, if you take a look at this chart I've prepared, if I can just get the machine working... Yes, there we are. Okay. Now, by looking at this chart, you can clearly see that in many countries there are fewer young people than there are old people. This means that the economic burden of caring for the elderly is placed on the shoulders of a few young working people, not just governments. In the past, of course, fewer old people would have been cared for by a far greater number of young people. Today, the situation has reversed, putting a huge financial strain on young people. Now, let's turn our attention to Asia. In Asia, there are countries such as India and China that have a vast population. This means that labor is very cheap. So, two things are happening. One is that more and more companies are outsourcing work to Asia. In other words, they manufacture their goods in Asian countries where wages are low and sell them in Western countries for inflated amounts. This is good for Asian countries, of course, because it means they can develop their economies. But as Asian people grow wealthier, many decide to go overseas to study, or even immigrate in some cases. Don't forget that many countries need skilled people such as engineers and nurses. So what we are witnessing today is a massive shift in the world's population from Eastern countries to Western countries. Now, if you take a look at this second chart I've prepared, you'll see that in 1999 alone, over 250,000 people moved from Asia to Western countries such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and of course, here in Britain. And over 80% of migrants were university students. But if we look back to the beginning of the 1990s, we can see a gradual rise in the number of migrants, from somewhere in the region of 45,000 in 1990, through to 136,000 in 1995 and 200,000 12 months later. And based on the present rate of expansion, we estimate that by the year 2010, somewhere in the region of three quarters of a million people will migrate from Asian countries to Western countries every year. Asians, though, are generally far more family-oriented than Western people are. Obviously, this is merely a cultural difference. 
But what it does mean is that they are more likely to have more children and at a younger age. So what this means is that as the white population decreases, the Asian population increases. Therefore, by the end of the century, it may well be an Asian country that has the economic power. However, do not be misled into thinking that this is a modern-day phenomenon. It's not. It's simply the natural ebb and flow of populations. It's a universal law of nature that certain populations grow in strength as others weaken. It happens just as much in the animal kingdom as it does in the world that humans live. Therefore, it's wrong to assume that we should do something to change what is happening or try to prevent it in some way. What we should do, however, is simply try to understand the forces involved and, through our investigations, try to gain a better understanding of the world in which we live. That concludes the lecture for today. But if any of you would like to follow up on some points I've mentioned here today, then I've put together quite a comprehensive reading list for you. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Feeling stressed before and during your IELTS exam is completely normal. The key is to manage your stress effectively so that it doesn't hinder your performance. Here are some tips. Before the exam, preparation is key. The more prepared you are for the exam, the less stressed you will feel. Make sure you are familiar with the format of the test and have practiced all four sections. Listening, reading, writing, and speaking. Extensively. Image of IELTS exam preparation. Get enough sleep. Aim for 7 to 8 hours of sleep the night before the exam. A well-rested body and mind will be better able to cope with stress. Eat a healthy breakfast. Avoid sugary foods that will give you a quick energy spike and then a crash. Opt for complex carbohydrates and protein to keep your energy levels stable throughout the exam. Practice relaxation techniques. Deep breathing exercises. Meditation. And yoga can all help to calm your nerves and reduce stress. Visualize success. Imagine yourself taking the exam calmly and confidently and doing your best. Positive visualization can help to boost your confidence and reduce anxiety. Talk to someone you trust. Talk to a friend, family member, or teacher about your concerns. Talking about your stress can help to diffuse it. During the exam, take deep breaths. If you start to feel stressed, take a few slow deep breaths. This will help to calm your heart rate and slow your racing thoughts. Stay focused on the task at hand. Don't worry about what might happen or what you did on the previous section. Focus all of your energy on the current task. Use positive self-talk. Tell yourself that you are capable and that you can do this. 